Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Growing With My Fellow Growers. I'm your host, Jack Greenstock, joined, as always, by an amazing panel. It looks like we've got most of the crew here today, so I'll pass it over first, as mm-hmm. usual, to Spartan Grown. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me again. Thanks for chat, for coming out and watching us. That's why we do this. And thanks for the panel, man. It's I tend to learn more than I fucking dish out for sure on this show. It's one of my mm-hmm. favorite favorite things about this show. <laughs> so I'm Spartan Grown. You can find me on Instagram at Spartan Grown. All one word, no spaces don't follow the pretenders and if you don't have instagram you can contact me at uh, gmail so spartan grown at gmail.com only in instagram and gmail important to know where to find them and uh, don't be fooled by the others next up brandon welcome back yo what's up everybody brandon rust here just doing my regular thing uh it's always great to be here with the rest of the panel members it's a privilege it's an honor and uh, I really appreciate everybody's input, and I really appreciate all the people that follow and listen. If you're not familiar with me, you can check me out on Instagram at rust.brandon. Be careful. There are a lot of fake accounts out there, um, so be aware of that. And you can also find me at uh, Bokashi, B-O-K-A-S-H-I, Earthworks, all one word, Bokashi Earthworks uh dot com for all your fertilizer amendment and microbe needs always happy to have you back and next up we've got uh bugs best friend or worst enemy depending on which side they're on uh matthew gates yeah hey everyone my name is matthew gates i'm an integrated pest management specialist and you can find some of my content on my youtube channel xenthanol you can also find me on instagram and twitter at sync angel s-y-n-c-h-a-n-g-e-l I also have a Patreon. For $1 a month, you can be a part of this Discord server where we talk about pests and IPM practices. And um, it's a really great place if you have like quick questions that you want to make them pretty reasonably quick. Um, and you can also find my uh, spring issue article in Skunk Magazine right now, uh, which is about all the pests you should be worried about and considering for 2022 springtime. And probably also summer for that matter. Yep. You need to check out that skunk magazine articles. That's dude. So much good information all up in there. Great stuff for sure. And next up we got Dr. MJ. Hey guys. Yeah. I'm Dr. MJ Coco from Coco for cannabis.com. I'm excited to be back for another fun week of growing with my fellow growers and uh, yeah, I'll keep it short. Next up, we got Kyle Breeder. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, I just got back from Maine from the Re- Regenerative Cannabis Conference. Uh, got some really cool stuff there. Met a lot of really good people. And uh, yeah, uh, purebreeding.com. If you're looking for feminized seeds, I do have some regline uh, cannabis seeds coming out as well, which are going to be uh, some really cool stuff, some really uh, air- some heirloom stuff. And uh, yeah, pure underscore breeding on Instagram, pure breeding Facebook. Yeah, feel free to reach out whenever, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Kyle's on like all the social medias and as pure breeding on all of them, so you can definitely know where to find him. Next up, we got Noah the Groa. How's it going, everybody? Uh, yeah, I'm Noah the Groa with two E's on Instagram. You can find me there. I've been growing for quite a while and involved in cannabis pretty much my entire life since I was in high school, and uh, happy to be here and get into it with all these other guys. Always happy to have you. And last and certainly not least, the American one. Hello, Jack and uh, everyone on the panel. It's good to see a packed panel tonight. Uh, always good to see everybody. Uh, I'm the American one on YouTube and the American one underscore with underscore Keens on the IG. Uh, and uh, always good to be here chatting up about cannabis and growing and all sorts of other stuff. And it's always good to see people in chat come back and hanging out with us Uh it's always great having them here. So Peace. I totally agree with that. Great to see Smart Poker. I saw you over on uh, Sundays and Confused on Smart Poker's channel earlier. And uh, great to see them in chat as always. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Aaron, the grower, who is not with us. Uh, he has been for a little while. I've been watching his Instagram updates, building out his uh, setup over in Oklahoma. So cheers to you, Aaron, and keep on grinding. That work's all going to pay off in the long run. But with that said, I want to pass it back to Kyle because uh, it sounds like you just went to the Regenerative Cannabis Conference and maybe you could uh, start us off by telling us a little bit about how that went, maybe uh, something you learned, some of the speakers that you maybe enjoyed and things like that. 
Uh, yeah, there was a lot of speakers there. Um, you know, a lot of uh, IPM. Uh, Matt would have loved it there, I'm sure. And maybe even probably could have said something. But uh, yeah, a lot of IPM stuff, a lot of uh, kind of where the industry is kind of heading, you know, how to survive, how not to survive. You know, a lot of that stuff came from uh, Kevin Jodry because he's seen, you know, it's like the, the economy up and down, whatever. Um, yeah, Josh from uh, Dust Blooms was there. Um, so a lot of really great people. I just kind of, it's, it's so hard to kind of uh, spit off what I learned. So it's just like a whole bunch of stuff at once. And I spent a lot of time outside with a lot of the people like Sharon. And I, I packed like, uh, I think like 70, 70 packages, separate packages that I gave out to people, which is, uh, you know, I, I sit up to like, geez, 2 a.m. the night before, just making sure I could have enough to try and give out to people. But uh, I handed out all of them. I made it, that was like my goal to hand out everything to everybody so they could all have to leave with something. Cause it was like a seed swap towards the end. And um, yeah, I got some stuff from Dutch Blooms and uh, talked to Josh for a little bit and um, talked to Kevin. Kevin had some uh, some Gonzi seeds that are like 100% authentic to uh, the Middle East. And it's, I'm wicked excited to tap into that. Um, yeah, it's really good people, man. It's just really nice. I made a post about it a little while ago. Like, it's just really nice to see uh, us as people like sharing, man. Like, just, like oh, man, somebody gave me, oh, my gosh, I have, I have, I took a video, but I have like, uh, like waffle cones and carrot sweet caramels and and weed and buds and joints everyone's just like handing we're all just sharing i don't even i had i didn't even, i was running out of room in my pockets and i had just like i'm holding joints in all my fingers and stuff i like and just all free stuff you know it's just really cool to see that people like you know like they put their hard-earned time and money and just willing to just share with people and it's like just such a different you know you go into like you know the civilian world or if you want to call it that and just it's just such a different vibe and, and the love that everyone has and it's just it's just really cool man Glad you had a good time. I think Dutch Bloom's maybe the one who puts on the uh, regenerative cannabis conference. Uh, Spartan's yeah. nodding over there. I think he went a few years ago as well and seemed like he had a good time. It seems like they always uh, do a pretty good job putting on a good presentation that the people enjoy. And the community aspect is something I always appreciate of those types of events, like the seed swap that you mentioned, and even just the community element of people uh, sharing all their different you know, goodies that you were able to describe there. We have a question uh, Spartan highlighted for us from Zach uh, Galisi, maybe, probably mispronouncing that. Does anyone know or have info on using Brandon Rust's fertilizers? None of them have application rates. Well, I know how to use, if he's talking about the carbon-based ones, I know that um, there is application rates. I think I got them off the website, maybe. Maybe, no, I think they might be right in the bottle. I can't remember, but I'm just, I'm using two ounces a gallon is what I'm using. That's the rate I'm using. I think and Brandon I, might have an answer. And I, I'm only using it, I'm only using it like once every two to three weeks. I'm not even using it that often. And it's working fucking great. Right now I've got the first kind of plant that's been getting it fully throughout. And uh, it's in late flower now and it's looking fucking great. So... I don't have any complaints with it. Uh, I have to add uh, like a little more. Well, I always kind of top dress gypsum anyway. So, but uh, there's like no calcium, I think. Right, Brandon, no calcium. And, but what about magnesium? I don't really, I'm not really adding any extra magnesium. No, no, the uh, magnesium is low too, but what it does do is it helps chelate anything that is also in your soil. And because so I can it still do an Epsom salt. It has water, water soluble source of calcium. It's going to also help stimulate the biology that's already in that system. Okay. Um, it does have ratios on it. It's on the the label. Mm -hmm. and okay. I know I saw it somewhere. One to 100 would mean that 10 milliliters for 1,000 milliliters. So one, uh, mm -hmm. 10 milliliters for uh, a liter. And so what that equ what e that equates to is approximately mm -hmm. 37 milliliters mm -hmm. per gallon. And you only have, you have a part, you have three different parts, right? You have one part that's for vegetative. And right. if it's small plants, you're not going to use that ratio. You're going to use maybe half that. So you'd use something like about 18 milliliters per gallon of water. I don't even use it on the small plants. I figure they got enough nutrition in my organic mix already. I don't add anything when they're real young. Yeah. Um, again, so the way that it, that, that works is that because it has the water soluble sources of calcium, everything's keep, like attached to um, the, those molecules. It works as a, 
dude it's fucking it dude it's so awesome because look dude it's got this um it's mm-hmm. it has the ability to keep things in an available form it doesn't react with the soil uh other than um if it has these other sites you know which it does because it has that extra amount of uh, mm-hmm. carbon attached to it you know carboxylic acid what will happen is <clears throat> it has a negative and positive uh, uh, sites on it so anything that is in an available form um ionic form i should say those ions will bind on to those sites that's how mm-hmm. you know organic matter works right and that's, that's one the of carbon the molecule you're talking about the or the extra sites on the carbon molecule yeah yeah, yeah. Nice. because you because what you get is you get the you get the mineral mm-hmm. nutrition mm-hmm. in the form that's available to a plant but it has to be sequestered by the system whether it's uh, through diffusion right mm-hmm. mass flow mm-hmm. transportation when it comes in contact mm-hmm. with the solution itself brandon can we ask you to uh put your phone on to do not disturb because every oh, three or four sorry. seconds we're getting a, a vibrate and it's just cutting off your it, it, it's like right next to the mic and i can barely hear <laughs> what you're saying I you're totally boom, apologize. Boom. but sorry go ahead you're, you're talking about your uh fertilizer there um yes so it's not my fertilizer. It was developed by Dr. George Caltiez. But um, so it has all the, the molecular ions that plant re- plants require because these things operate on such small scales. We're talking about like, if we we're going to look at how they were actually functioning, we would need a scanning electron microscope right because they yeah. and, and even water at that level right when we think of like fluid water the plant takes in ionic water right and it's more you can think of it almost like a vapor like kind of like a gas right and so other minerals and ions will be attached you know and they'll kind of just flow with this like gaseous solution that's how calcium is taken up vpd through the transport of um water in solution but when we're talking about in solution we can look at it from like soil solution and then then like the molecular water which is like a gaseous and you can see how like almost like like you could say the available to the plant water (laughs) yeah yeah and okay and you know how if you were to take like uh like a plate of water right and if you put a sponge in in that and you held it up right and there was water in there you would see like the water would like defy gravity it would kind of move up and the sponge the whole sponge eventually would get wet right and that's the idea of like diffusion because um water and lower concentration gradients of whatever it is a nutrient or whatever it'll move through solution whether it's you know gravity has any kind of impact on it right and so the way that that works is the 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 root will kind of diffuse nutrients and so inside of the cell will have a a, a gradient of like ions and they can do that that's like the fusion that's all most of our phosphorus is taken up so it's it's uh it's really interesting because when you have something that's attached to these carbon molecules it acts as a transport catalyst where the where they'll move in solution without reacting in solution or with the other molecules in that system and so when something is uh, in, a, in a lower gradient, maybe inside the root tissue, yeah. and it like wants to increase it and it moves in mass flow, and then diffu- it can diffuse, right, through the, uh, the lower concentrations that are in soil, through the, uh, 
or the higher concentrations that are in soil to the lower concentrations that are in the root zone. So Brandon, with that said, you uh, Spartan runs in a soil or a, like, you know, it's technically like a soil list probably, but uh, we could call it a soil compared to like a cocoa. Right. But we never yeah. killed Kenny just asked, Hey, Brandon, has anyone reported using those carbon based nutrients in cocoa using high frequency fertigation? And I'm curious myself, um, how would they interact? Or would it be the solo nutrient feed or would you be Good. running your regular system with that as an addition? No, you couldn't right now. So, well, you could run that. I have right here my bios. form for a passport and my also my verification for my birth certificate through a certified source or whatever. And and the reason is is because I'm going to go down to the the facility in Mexico to help formulate something that can be used for inert medias. Right. But this was originally developed for soils. Right. And typically when you have a soil, it already has a pretty good amount of calcium because a lot of agricultural agronomic soils are high in calcium. Yeah. Um, and even if it's not like nice, plant cheap. available calcium, the fertilizer itself will help solubilize that calcium. Magnesium is usually not an issue because it's so soluble uh, as it falls into solution. Um, and uh, most soils, if they don't have enough, it, it's really, really easy to add that in into really small quantities. Um, you know, so it it's different for different applications. Uh, you will have a formulation that can be used for um, hydroponics, right? And what that would look like is because it doesn't fall out of solution, it's just dependent on the plant's ability to take up that nutrient. If you can create a formulation that's perfect across the board, you can create a, a continuous cycle. And then you would basically be monitoring your um your like parts per million right and if that gets so, low then you would add a little more to the solution top it off yeah. with water and keep going with that system so i think it might a, work in a recirculating maybe because yeah, you yeah exactly it'd be a recirculating system where you would add clean water you would top it off and you would just be able to keep it going because it's not losing anything it's not gonna form those salts that you see form up in these solutions because they're not reacting with each other, right? It's not reacting in solution. It's not reacting with the uh, media itself. So Zach G from earlier, I'm not going to try out the last name because I'm definitely going to butcher it. And I uh, have a last name that people often butcher anyway, so I can relate. They say, uh, can you ask when you use complex humates and also about foliar applications? Well, for you, foliar applications of anything are uh, difficult, right? Because one, you need to start with clean water, which means that it can't be uh, water that's going to react for, with whatever it is that you're going to put into solution. You're solely, they would say, in chemistry, right? Um, to, because what happens is when you re, when you put things into water, they react with the hydrogen in the water. That's why pH is kind of like important. Um, so you need to start off with clean water. If you're talking about humic and fulvic acids, um, fulvic acids are going to be a more usually more soluble, and they're going to be able to hold. Uh, smaller particles. If you're going to use a foiler application of any type of mineral nutrient, whether it's fulvic or like something like C90, which is a highly mineralized, um, uh, like a, a dehydrated seawater, basically. <laughs> yeah, you know it has. Isn't that like what C90 is? Yeah, that's what he just said. C90. Oh, okay, sorry, I was reading. Yeah. 
And well, Brandon, I think he know, was talking or whatever about, it might be. He was you know, talking about specifically your human you know, equalizer. He's, yeah, he's you know, whatever about. it is that you're trying to get in at a specific point, you know, if you're saying, hey, I need to target this at this point, let's hit this. You need to have clean water, but also you need to make sure environmental parameters are correct too, because VPD, especially when it comes to these uh, organic systems that are really dependent on like uh, phosphate, uh, carbon and nitrogen cycling, potassium cycling, uh, not so much, um, but being able to get the, uh, the uh, you know, the mineral nutrition um, and get everything kind of like on point with the environment is going to have a huge effect on how those things like uptake things, you know, again, because we're talking about, you know, the reason why I was talking about the, uh, you know, how like water and you think about it as like vapor is because water moves just like phosphorus, right? It diffuses into uh, lower concentration gradient. So if you have less water in the atmosphere, or it's drier, it's going to release more, you know? And if you don't have, if that water, right, is, is hard to access, right? Or if it dries out, it becomes harder for that diffusion to happen or that, you know, that, that, that gradient to become, you know, in a state of homeostasis, you could say. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely consider that not a hundred percent of the water you pour in is being used by the plant. So I like that you're talking about like how it's diffusing or like evaporating or being a vapor being taken up because not a hundred percent of what you're pouring in is being taken up by the plant. They're taking nutrients and certain parts of that water <clears throat> that they need. And some of it's run off and some of it evaporates into the atmosphere, but some of it is uh, uptaking it to the plant, maybe in ways that we wouldn't traditionally think. Um, I think I like part of that right. question, unless, unless I'm reading it wrong, I think he's asking basically just, what, you know how you should have different timing on the three-part fertilizer that you have. I think he's yeah. talking specifically about that middle one. What part of the plant life is he supposed to be using that? And I think that's part of his question. Like, Complex, I use it right, right around flip. Complex yeah. has both high nitrogen and high potassium. And the reason is, is because when that specific time of growth, it's using those things in abundance, in more abundance, right? So it does still have all those other mineral, mineral nutritions in it too. Uh, we have a uh, new labeling coming out. Like there's so much stuff going on. It's crazy. So all, all the new labels are being registered throughout all the States. Um, we had to redo the trademark because it says NutriGrow on there and then we can't do that. So it's going to be called smart carbon. We did a, like a whole rebranding thing. It's going to have the directions are going to be in uh out uh i guess gap it's going to be more readable for um it's not going to u.s be market metric. it's not going to be in metric i love metric uh it's really easy to do math with metric the more that i you know use it so metric makes sense but in, in america <laughs> we use gallons <laughs> and so uh I guess you have to, you know, cater to the audience that you're pitching it to, right? So I guess it makes sense. The Canadians probably of, love you with your metric. There's a lot of things happening though. Yeah. It's 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 gonna quickly change. And Are you able to get into Canada yet? I know that's a hard market for a lot of nutrients, microbes and things like that. Have you even tried to go into Canada? Yeah. Um, so we have our Omri packet and it's all about just here. This is what I learned, right? In um uh Steve Rasner, Potent Ponics, he kind of like turned me on to this too. So shout out to him. Um, he said that if you get your uh, your product registered for like the the Canadian standard and like Canadian labs, then it's good for like uh, most 
EU nations when it comes to like an army certification. And a lot of this is just about registering it, making sure people know what it is. It's just, it's a lot of work, you know, it's work. You got to put in the actual work. You got to copy and paste things. It's best for us to um, do all the applications for California, Washington, and Oregon, and then replicate any of that stuff. Because I was always taught that, uh, yeah, like for, for pesticide companies and places like, and even fertilizers and other things, they have like one specific department for California and they have everywhere else. And I kind of agree with the concept that um, if, you know, if you're able to go by the, I mean, of course it's way more expensive and there's other factors, but like, if you are able to sort of work at that level or at that uh, um, uh, rubric, then, you know, the other stuff is a piece of cake. Yeah. You got to crack that hardest nut first. And then the other dominoes kind of just start falling because if you can get it in California and not to mention California has 40 million people, which is larger than all of Canada. So once you can crack the California market, which is also like the fifth largest economy in the world and mostly ag, uh, it's a big, big deal. So once you can get in here, um, most of the rest of the U S should kind of be easy. So I wish you the best with that. But I wanted to kick it over to uh, Noah the Groa for a little bit, just to get an update and uh, see how things are going in your garden, because we haven't heard from you in quite a bit. It's nice to have you back. Hey, hey sorry about that. Yeah, um, I've been doing a lot of stuff in my room. Uh, I've been kind of uh, scaling back up and getting everything back running. I actually just got a few different new new stuff in my room. I got uh, runts. I'm trying to think, I got platinum skittles. I got some uh, Afghan cherries, new and rock candy uh, seeds that I popped that I got from uh, Kyle. And um, those are doing good. You know, they're still just kind of little, but I've been uh, doing that. I've been doing a lot of stuff. Like I've been starting a whole bunch of stuff for my vegetable garden. With everything that's happening in the world right now, I encourage everybody listening to try and get a vegetable garden if you have the space. Growing your own food is going to be a vital skill for people to learn, I think, in the next few years. And uh, I'm really, I'm actually really focused on that. Um, I know a little bit about it. I've been doing it for a couple of years, but I mean, I usually just buy starts and be lazy and stuff, but we started everything from seeds. I got, that's where I got that little two by four tent. I just got one of my little T5s in there right now. And uh, I got a bunch of corn and squash and um, all kinds of stuff. We get some sunflowers for the birds and squirrels and stuff. And, but in my room, like I said, I got that, the runs, that's what I'm really excited about. Boy, it's been really just taking off. Well, I got it probably about a foot tall in like a month. It's probably closer to three feet. So it's getting ready to get flipped. And um, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. That sounds like a good spot to be. Honestly, I really like that you're focusing on the uh, food garden. A lot of people, uh, skin, myself, currently I don't have the space, but I want to get a plot at there's we have a local community garden and you can pay x amount of dollars per month or year and get yourself like a little raised bed set up and just start growing a little bit here and there and maybe encourage some of my neighbors and friends to maybe get in on that with me as well one thing that you said that you're doing is starting all from seed this year which i uh, commend you for going through with that because it is more challenging than getting starts and i don't discourage people if they want to go and get starts because i know like you said in the past you were able to do that and it's sometimes the way that gets people going but it is a nice little challenge when you start from a seed i think sometimes people care about it more when they start the life themselves and they get it sprouted up from the seed and go all the way through the process so i think there's benefits to both sides of things and uh, i'm just happy that you're out there doing it and advocating others to it the whole victory garden thing still rings really true in my mind and heart today because so, supply chain so check this out last year we went to a new nursery and got our starts and they all looked pretty good but i don't know what they had but they had some kind of a bug and they all pretty much got got killed and i even told my wife i said well i could probably hit them with something you know i got some different things i could spray some organic stuff on it and she was like no it should be okay and it, they some of them came up but they were all uh pretty much uh not that great because of whatever bug we got from the nursery so uh, no, this year I said, well, one. I said this year we're going to do it from seed. So we, glad I got a whole that. bunch of stuff. We have a whole bunch of stuff. I, I'm going to go in here and look here in a second and see what we have. She has two full trays of it and we're going to do a huge garden this year. And uh, yeah, after that last year, because we paid like 80 bucks for a bunch of starts last year. And like I said, maybe a, a third of it lived. 
So I usually do the same thing. There's a local uh, greenhouse that I usually get my starts at. And uh, they usually do well. But now that you say that, I'm going to fucking spray them anyway. As soon as they come home, they're getting sprayed with Lost Coast. Fuck it. Man, you got me. You got me worried. It doesn't hurt. IPM is definitely something that should transfer, I think, across the gardens, especially if you're using good stuff and uh, mainly crop scouting. And and I definitely want to because I don't want to bring this shit into my home garden. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) So I definitely thought of cannabis. Thought of vegetables. That's what I was. That's what I was going to spray Spartan as well. Is Lost Coast and some of them are different though, Tao. And I and I love Lost Coast, so I, I advocate for that too. I'm a big fan of that product as well. But yeah. I said, uh, if you could start a cannabis seed, you could start a vegetable seed, which I agree with. If you can grow a cannabis plant, I think it's it can be finicky and you know difficult to get started or whatever some, for some people. But um, from the different seeds that I've sprouted in my lifetime, not all of them are just like you're going to throw it in a wet paper towel and it's going to sprout. Like each one, just Google how do you sprout a you know orange seed or how do you sprout a sunflower seed or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, some of them you just plant it in dirt, okay. but other ones need kind of finicky like. Um, I'm trying to think a of long time too. like an avocado, like the pit. Freeze. You have to do weird stuff to it. The yeah. Strawberry, you have to freeze first. Yeah, there's something like that. And uh, but yeah, I I got tomato starts from seeds, and a uh, cucumber came out of the ground already. Yeah, I've got a bunch of seeds too. There'll be like like lettuces and stuff. I like to do that from seed, but like peppers stuff that's slow to go, to take off i let them have the plant count i don't want to have to fuck with it and keep them alive let them do all that and I'll, I'll get it going when i'm ready to put them outside i love seeing like non-cannabis plants being grown in the tents it just always uh catches my eye when you see because i'm so used to just seeing cannabis in there so when you see like a solo yeah. cup with a non-cannabis yeah. sprout i'm like whoa wait what is it <laughs> so no you could uh tell us maybe what we're looking at here for a little bit yeah yeah um they're all labeled I got, I don't know what that is. My wife is the one that's been helping me out with this mostly, but I've been just kind of been just kind of helping her do some things. We got, um, color. Is this a bio three, six, five soil? Absolutely. <laughs> you know it. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, Everything looks pretty green and heavy. And, yeah. Oh yeah. And you know what? I'm thinking I'm going to spray them with some lost coast. Just, I'm wondering if I should dilute it down a little bit because they're so small, like maybe dilute it like even like 20%, 30% and kind of walk it up. But Yeah, probably wouldn't hurt. I don't I mean, know. If the, you're going, I would just think that if you're going for the uh, the IPM aspect of it, you want to go the strength that they recommend, I think. Just do it with the lights off. Of course. Yeah, usually. Off. Yeah, usually. Or like if you're really, um, you know, if you're, if you're really cautious, maybe they'll do half a rate. You know, if you can sure. afford to, that sort of a thing. You know, I heard a lot of people from the uh, Regenerative Ag Conference uh, were asking me about onion thrips afterwards because they're getting a lot more and they should definitely uh, get the recognition that they deserve. Um, much like Western flower thrips are on a lot of, a lot of various plants. Um, chili thrips are kind of like that too. And, they look, and a lot of these thrips look very, very similar. In fact, the, the major difference, uh, one of the major differences is that their size is a little bit different. Uh, Western flower thrips are a bit larger. I do have um, a short little primer on the onion thrips that I could share my screen about, because I think some people might find a benefit to that. You definitely have the uh, permission. I, I've gotten into the habit now of clicking multiple participants can share screen simultaneously before the show starts. But while you uh, go and access that, Keystone Cops asked, um, oh, never mind. You got it quickly. I was ready. <laughs> I appreciate that. I like to prepare before I ask that permission. Um, so, yeah, so just very quickly, these are, and, I, and I'm curious about that question. Um, Thrift Tabasi or Thrift maybe Thrift Tabaki. That's like tobacco right there. That's the epithet, the species epithet. So onion thrips, um, just a little bit about them. They're found in many parts of the world. As you can see, they are uh, globally uh, present. Um, you can find them on various plants here. I'm not playing the audio okay. here, but everywhere. if you are Yeah, <laughs> pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, I, um, I, uh, I'm not playing the audio, but if you're curious for more of the details, um, you know, I would recommend that you take a look at the video. It's only about three minutes long. Um, a little bit about also the viruses that they vector, but yeah, I can see them on onions and watermelon and tobacco, of course, um, and things like this. You can even um, see the damage to that tobacco leaf. It's uh, They do some serious damage to plants, that's for sure. 
Yeah, it's, they cause like a stippling damage, just very similar to like Western flower thrips, the sort of scraping of the leaves. Um, just like Western flower thrips, you can get uh, uh, populations where the females that have unfertilized eggs make males, and then those males mate with the females and get females. That's typical for haplodiploids. A lot of insects are like this in mites. But there also are populations where unfertilized eggs of females make more females, and so they just keep doing that. But if they do come across a male, then that actually produces more males. Um, and there, these populations do seem to be, in, in the research that I've seen, they seem to be very selective. Um, but again, like this kind of a behavior can maybe become more common um, over time. So just a little thing to consider. Uh, this is a little bit about their uh, population uh, growth rates and things on, on various plants. This is their, their age old ecology, uh, life history stuff, intrinsic rate of increase, reproductive rate, uh, and all this sort of stuff. This would be like doubling time. So that's obviously, you know, how long does it take to double <laughs> the population, right? Um, and this is on two types of onions and tobacco. And as you can see, there's a difference between the tobacco and the onion. Um, and what else did I have from here? Oh, yeah, there's this graph too. Um, yeah, and this sort of shows that, uh, again, you kind of see there's sort of a difference, um, cultivar to cultivar. And I always like to bring this up because this is also going to be true for cannabis as well. Um, although we don't have a lot of data about what it is about the plants that can cause them to be resistant in cannabis specifically, which is what I'm very curious to get more information about, um, um, especially from entomologists and that. And we are going to get more of that, I think, in the, in the next few years. But um, we can use this sort of information to sort of extrapolate somewhat. And then, of course, also there's this concept in a lot of crops called like a, an action threshold, um, an economic threshold, basically the idea that um, you can maybe tolerate some level of presence without getting much of a yield loss on your plants. Um, and for some plants, it doesn't really matter. One is enough because the cosmetic damage of the pest is too great or um, you just want to get ahead of it, which is totally valid as a proactive measure. I am also of this mind, but uh, in large fields, that can be very difficult to assess. But then there's also a point where um, they're damaging so much that the yield you're going to get is going to cost as much as or more than the treatment regimen that you're going to use. So that's just a concept that's always a fun thing to introduce. And that is it. It looks like abamectin was one of the treatments, unfortunately. Hopefully that's not. Yeah. Being used on the cannabis. <laughs> Honestly, uh, there's, they, they often grow, uh, grow resistant to that sort of thing anyway. So, um, you know, even, even if you're one of those people who want to use that on cannabis, which I do not recommend at all, it's very bad. Um, it's probably not going to work very well, especially over time. Well, I guess that's good news. And one thing I noticed was, uh, I think the word is fecundity or the reproduction rate seems like it's a little bit slower than maybe like a spider mite, uh, longer hatching times and looks like a little bit slower rate if I'm remembering things correctly, but is that true? And where would you rate them on like a scale of like one to 10 on like 10 is like very, very difficult for a cultivator to fight. And like one is, this is a cakewalk or something easy. I feel like, um, I would rate them at like maybe like mid-level or so like they're, they're, Thrips typically don't like kill your plant, especially if we're talking about in the case of cannabis, but they can like in fruits and vegetables, like we already mentioned earlier, Victory Garden, big supporter of that. Um, you know, they can cause some damage to your plants. They can, they, it'll cause some stunting if they vector a virus. Um, and some of that damage can cause like a, a leaf drop and fruit drop and flower drop, which will of course affect your yields. But in cannabis, I think they're mostly a cosmetic problem for the most part, but you can get tons of them. And as long as you have access to the right resources, though, you can control them, like with predatory mites or um, with certain botanical insecticides and that kind of a thing. I find that they're, they're, they can be remedied. Um, and if you're growing indoor, it's all the more easier. But if you're growing outdoor, it's way harder. I might bump that up to a seven or an eight, uh, just in difficulty of getting rid of them, not necessarily like overall damage. Okay, so the rate of reproduction isn't necessarily the issue with getting rid of them. They're just a tough pest generally. And just uh, everywhere. outdoor, yeah, they're outdoor, just, they, yeah, they just keep coming widespread. Yeah. yeah, that seems like it's it's <laughs> wave after after wave. It can be uh, daunting to want to battle against a predator like that. But um, with that said, I think we have a good question from Keystone Cops. If uh, you feel like you've adequately touched on the on onion thrip info, I definitely for have. Good, good. Well, Keystone Cops asks. Uh, one source of friction for me is cleaning drip lines, removing them from the tent, purging them, actually clearing them. 
It's annoying. Do panel members have any tips? And they also followed up by saying, um, my situation is fertigation with Jax, which is like a, the nutrient line, in a sterile H2O2 reservoir at high frequency uh, into coir or core, if you want to pronounce it that way, uh, if that matters. And then, yeah, we'll go from there. Yeah, I already asked um, a clarification on this. If he was talking like during the grow, if he was feeling like he was forced to clean out the system or if it was only between grows, um, you, you know, I think it's always going to, and it turns out he's only doing this, I think, between grows. If he was forced to clean out during the grow, I, I think I could offer some tips to, to sort of keep the system running cleaner um, and avoid that. But you know, I, I don't think I'm going to offer tips to sort of avoid cleaning out the system in between grows. Um, I think that that is good practice. Um, you know, he's talking about running bleach through, which might be more than you need, especially if you're able to, if he's already using uh, strong hydrogen peroxide, you could just use that. But, um, it, you know, I, so I'm not sure I'll be able to tough or much that's going to make that side of the task um, considerably easier for him. Um, you know, it's a good opportunity to revisit some of the, like the, the good rules for running an automatic watering system like this, though. Um, one of them is you should have the system set up in such a way that water doesn't stay in the lines um, after each event. And the way I have my system set up usually is to have a siphon basically pull the water out of the lines back into the reservoir tank. Um, after the pump stops shouting, the, the siphon draws the water back and, and sort of cleans the lines. Um, but in order to, to do that, you can't break the siphon. If you break the siphon, then you have to be damn sure that the, the emitters are the lowest point in the line. Um, so the water will drain out the emitters and into the pots when the pump stops working. Um, if you don't have either of those sort of things and the water just sits in the tubes in between each event, um, that can lead to, to problems with the drip system. And it's also not that great for the plants. Um, but no, I, you know, for the first original question, I think taking down the system and, and cleaning it out is, is good practice in between grows. I agree with that. Uh, the one thing I'll say is sometimes it's worth doing a cost benefit analysis of what, like, I don't know, a hundred feet or 50 feet worth of hose that you use for the emitters costs. Because mm -hmm. when I was cleaning stuff like that for like my uh, cloner and things like that, I realized that you could just buy like a 50 foot coil of it for, relatively cheap and i know it's not the best thing for the environment but um i felt like to have a clean sterile tube every single time was worth it for me versus like cleaning it and wondering like did i do an adequate job cleaning but with all that said i totally agree with doc's tips about having the siphon not leaving water in the tubes and uh, hopefully not having to clean it out mid-run at any point if you have like good practice using the h2o2 and keeping things sterile in the reservoir etc so what we do at work we're running athena <laughs> Athena nutrients when they're in their line there's a product i believe it's called cleanse cleanse yeah i believe it's cleanse and you add just, it's like one mil per gallon or something and it's periatric acid and that's going to keep those lines help keep bacteria things like that from ever form or they'll kill it if it's there and then that's run through the lines all the time you know with the regular feed but then at the end when we're all harvested and are all done and we do a reset we'll run a product from BioWorks through called uh, Zerotol. And uh, after we clean the whole table off and everything, we'll run the emitters. We'll take the emitters off. So it's just the spaghetti lines and we'll let it just flood the tables with that Zerotol. So it's like an extra precaution. It's, it's not only flooding the lines with it, it's, it's helping flush the table with it. That's smart. I think I like the Zerotol product. Um, I'm a fan of their line in general i think that they make good products for cleaning and uh, being able to use in, in grow settings so good on you guys for taking the extra precaution and trying to keep things safe and not spending the extra cost if you don't have to when you can effectively clean and sanitize between runs um if anybody else has thoughts on that i guess you could jump in now because we got another question uh, coming up if you don't I have one more thought which is use wet water so use a surfactant and um yeah. or wetting agent and 
you know, that usually keeps emitters from clogging. Um, it's one of the sort of benefits of running wet water. But yeah, if you're using an automatic watering system, you should, your water should be wet. And even for cleaning, I think that um, adding some sort of surfactant because it helps more deeply like penetrate and clean things like you're talking about with like a laundry detergent. A lot of it is the surfactant properties making the also water watering too, more effective yeah. at cleaning. It's exactly. Good all the way around. It's a, it's a huge, something that people under um, estimate and, and don't often consider. And it could be something as simple as like soap nuts can be a surfactant, you know, and yeah, cheap, yucca powder. I, I like yucca powder in the absence of sort of another purpose based um, product that acts as a wedding agent. Yucca powder is so concentrated. You use like tiny, tiny amounts and it exactly. lasts forever. That's the best part. Yeah. Exactly. You use one tenth of like an eighth of a teaspoon per five gallons or something. I can't remember exactly what the ratio is, but it's it's literally like just a, a pinch per five gallons. Um, and you can tell the difference that it makes. Uh, I love mixing the wedding agents in because the water sort of behaves differently. When I mix nutrients in a bucket and I'm stirring it, you can notice how the water splashes differently once it's wet. It sort of doesn't splash as much. It is different. Uh, interesting the different dynamics water can have. Like I used to dive and you could tell like uh, certain pools would have different texture, like softer or like harder water when you'd hit. And like uh, sure. it's, it's fascinating the chemical makeups and things like that, pH. All that stuff sort of plays a role, but getting to Maverick's question, they say um, more specifically xenthanol. Setting up everything for outdoor this year is Bavaria bassiana helpful when facing leaf hoppers? I mentioned this in the comments, but in case anyone else was curious, um, I would find that to be sort of difficult. I don't know they're so control. Hmm? Oh, I didn't hear you, Kyle. That. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. No, I was, no, I was just curious. Oh, okay. Um, basically, uh, Bouveria is great for a lot of things, but the leaf hoppers in specific, they're like really, you know, their eyesight's very good and their reaction time is even gooder because when you go in to like spray like a location where they might be, they're going to hear, they're going to see your movement and they're basically. Uh, behaviorally adapted to just move away from any sort of disturbance like that, especially if the plants shake, which they should for the coverage of the spray, whether you're using Bouveria or, or another chemical compound. Leafhoppers are super difficult to deal with for that reason alone. Um, and they oftentimes they'll like come in and they'll feed on the plants and they'll just leave <laughs> if you're in a, an environment where that's easy to do. Um, actually, I just had somebody... Um, asked me a question they had grasshoppers in their indoor which was kind of surprising to me but you know it does happen um so one of the things that i would use against them i mean you could use some of these botanical insecticides and try to get them it would be easier in an indoor environment but honestly i think it's very difficult to achieve that coverage that you uh would really want to get um so you would probably want to rely on more on like some sort of a physical barrier oftentimes if you can afford to do that Great advice. Uh, physical barriers are always effective when you're able to implement them, for sure. Uh, Chad Westport had an interesting question that made me smile and giggle a little bit. And I don't think that the research is to this point yet, but I'm going to pass it to you, Matthew. They ask, uh, do insects, <laughs> it says, that makes me think, is there such thing as a left-handed insect? Like they were wondering, is there any studies like showing, is there an equal ratio of uh, right to left-handed insects or right to left-handed dominance. And I thought that was just very silly, but uh, I figured I'd pass it to you, Matthew. If you've, if you've seen anything like that, you'd be the only person that I know who's esoteric enough in insect research to have come across something like that, if it exists. So the only thing, the closest thing that I have to that, which I think you will accept is pretty close, um, is not a handedness sort of a thing, but it's more so um, certain research on on the way that uh, hexapods uh, walk. So not just insects, but also other uh, arthropods that have six legs. So more like the primitive insects or the proto insects or the, just the hexapoda like springtails is really the main one I'm talking about here. Um, the insect that isn't, but um, that's because a lot of it, and this is also true for spiders too, which have, you know, an octopodal, right? They have got uh, eight legs, right? 
Um, and I guess they, there's like honeybees, especially where, where people have looked and seen like how they kind of, um, like where they basically where they place each foot, like their gait essentially, and also how that's been affected if they're damaged in some way, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and as you probably would guess, because a lot of insects do lose legs through, um, you know, getting away from a, a scrape with something that's going to kill them or eat them um, or through maldevelopment or something like that. A lot of insects and other arthropods are pretty adapt are pretty adept at um, moving with one, two, or even three, maybe only even half their legs, as long as it's the, as long as there's an even amount on, or an even enough amount on each side. So that's my answer to that. That's interesting. It's like uh, when an airplane loses an engine, it could still fly as long as it's got two wings, you know, <laughs> it keeps it balanced enough. But uh, if you lose the wing, you're in trouble. <laughs> but yeah, like then, Klingons, they have lots of uh, redundancies about their physiology. The crazy thing is, uh, my dad had a friend who was a uh, like a wartime uh, pilot, and he said he got shot down like three or four times and lived through all of them. And um, the thing that he said that was crazy is, as long as you have like surface area. So he said, even in the one instance, he had like both engines and a wing shot off, just the one wing like had enough surface area that he was able to like somewhat guide the ship to a uh, stable landing. So I wonder if an insect. I've seen like bees with like a single. Um, I don't know what, what's a wing is the technical term. Wait, so, yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, interestingly enough, they can uh, still survive, not necessarily fly. It was walking around, but yeah, they, they do survive certain uh, scuffles and it, I, I've seen them with less than the regular amount of legs still getting around. And it's, it's very interesting. I think that they study that stuff to try and uh, monitor overall health, probably of populations, because we feel like those populations might be important, but some definitely dispute like the honeybee because it's so cultivated. Anyway, getting back to growing stuff, Spartan, uh, what are you uh, smoking on and growing on over there? And how, how are things going in Michigan? Right now, I've been uh, smoking on, uh, actually, I the last two days, I went over and helped. Uh, I threw it up on my story today, I believe, on Instagram. But uh, I went over to my buddy Bake's house because he's doing a build out in his garage. He's got a huge garage. And uh, he's doing it upright with the fucking PVC panel walls. And uh, so we were in there today hanging doing the ceilings because he's going to have insulators coming in and sucking out all the blow, old blown insulation out of there. So that's fun working around that stuff anyway. But then, uh, so we got, I think ha about half, we're probably over halfway done with the ceiling of the entire. So it's going to be, let me see, there's a whole veg space. There's a uh, hash room. There's a dry room. There's two flower rooms. Yeah. I think that's it. He ain't messing around. He's got the seed collection for it. So damn, he might oh, as well build yeah, it out and start popping. Yeah, it's so fucking I, I fucking get chills when I go in there because you know you walk in and you can you could just see in your head what it can be, you know, and you're like, oh god, this is gonna be fucking beautiful. So yeah, so I've been doing that and uh and so we had uh he had I brought a whole ounce of this uh it's basically a jelly bean pheno that somebody hunted in Florida. And uh his name was Ash King, I believe it was on Instagram. And it's, uh, he calls it the Orange Dreams Haze uh, cut. And I took an ounce of that and we squished it down. And uh, we're smoking that rosin. And uh, it was some good shit. And that's actually what I have today in my little Dr. Dabber. I'm still smoking it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's what I've been smoking on. Good stuff. Sounds good. And uh, I love to hear people building out their kind of like dream setup for home grow at least like that's like a commercial setup at home and when people blow out their garages and have a hash room and drying room set up in there yeah it's it. fucking it's gonna be fucking awesome yeah and that's basically it looks like it's gonna be you know a mini version of work so that's that's just cool it's smart if i had the space i'd be doing it for sure it's uh you know you get your return on electricity pretty easily there once you uh start pulling down some dank yep yep exactly and uh he's he knows what's up and he's got it designed pretty good to where it might be like kind of a pain to do some of the steps now, but once it's all done and set up, it's going to make it a breeze to work in. Like literally when we're done with these panels, you go in that room at, after a harvest and just take a fucking pressure washer and just spray down the fucking walls and he's got a fucking floor drain. So, I mean, come on. It's a dream right there. Yeah. It's fucking amazing. He works over with you at uh, Mitten Canico, right? So he has some insight yeah. onto the build. Yes. Um, yeah. How how big is the crew over there now? How, what's your full? That's five. We're at five. So it's uh, Steve and the owner, 
and uh, boss. And then it's, uh, let me see, Skeet and Friends on Instagram. One guy, TJ, who's not on his, on anything. <laughs> and then me and Bates. That's, That's wild, man. Uh, it's crazy to think when you see the posts coming out of there because all the thousand, I don't know what your plant count is. I think it's over a thousand though at this point, right? 2,000 2, plant count. 2,000 plant count, big rooms full of uh, dank flowers. You guys are definitely making a lot happen with just five people over there. So I uh, usually pull down 150 plants. That's a harvest every two weeks. So that's what we're doing now. That's the plan for this year. Just 150. No How big. big are your plants? Yeah. How much like square footage is that, Spartan? So I wish I knew. I can tell you the tables of so the canopy space at least. So it's uh, they're four foot wide tables and they're 40 foot long. And there's three of them. So four, one, six, whatever the fuck that is. <laughs> four times 40 times three. I think that's 16, 16. 20 times three is like 360. 360 square feet. Okay. Of so table that's, space. And that's each harvest. That's each harvest. Yep. And we have, we have six flower rooms that we're on rotation harvesting. Okay. What uh of those six flower rooms? Are any of the strains? I know that some like you have to like mask up because the terps are so aggressive that they're like you're like yeah. almost like allergic to it. What, what are your favorites? Worst. That's the worst one. But what's your yeah, favorite one to go into? Like you're like, oh, this is gonna be fun to walk it, in there. I love the smell of this room. It's called Mac Flurry, and it's uh, a Mac One cross to a Slurry King from. I, I know that very well. I, I, I'm yeah. a fan of that strain I'm more yeah. than I am a Mac. I'm a more of a Mac Flurry fan because yeah. I like Slurry King. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's what it is. It's like a fucking Slurry King that's like a frosty as Mac, and it's but it's the Slurry King heavy on terps, and so it's. It's a nice one. It doesn't grow slow. It's 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 pretty nice. It's a nice version. It's a nice twist on Mac. We'll say I don't. I won't call it Mac, but it's a nice twist on it. And I really like that. That's probably my favorite one we have right there. Although uh, we also are, um, I haven't been able to smoke it yet, but we're growing that Cobra's milk. We've got a table going in one of the rooms, and it's smelling like you know, like fruity pebbles, like the milk of fruity pebbles. I would say because it's like a muted. It's not like super in your face but it's like a muted like a like the cereal milk i guess and that was a fruity pebbles or a cereal milk cross wasn't it it was no it was uh cereal milk and jealousy oh yeah yeah you, we've talked about this one a couple of times and i always talk about how much i love the cereal milk but yeah. definitely looking like you guys are going to come across some fire with that i'm excited to see what you find yeah me too i'm really excited on that one so that's probably the one i'm most excited for but we haven't tried yet yeah, I just want to make a quick point. Um, I told this to Maverick in the chat, uh, but I want to say here auditorially in case people aren't looking at the chat, which is that um, the leaf hoppers, you know, one just one of the one of the small things to consider about leaf hoppers is that the beet leaf hopper is the vector for beet curly top virus, and I've talked about it in the past, but it is a big problem in many different crops, um, not just cannabis but it's sort of an emerging pest. And it's one of the ones that I talked about in my spring article, uh, Skunk Magazine for Pests You Gotta Know About. And um, I'd like more and more people to be aware of it. So yeah, so just you know, look up what beet curly top virus is, look up um, the beet leaf hopper, look up its host range and things like that. It's often found in North America, but it's also found globally as well. So just because you're not in maybe like the States or Europe or something like that doesn't mean that um, you're immune from getting it. And uh, the beet curly top virus is a major problem and, and it will, it will kill your yield and also your plants. So wouldn't, might, this, wouldn't there be some kind of fungus out there that we could get to be like, that's a systemic on the plant so that, yeah, they're fast and everything, but if they actually take a bite out of the plant, they could maybe get an infection at that point. Um, maybe BB, is that a possibility or is there another one? Like blueberry would be an example where that might be possible, but um, I just really don't know if that's uh, pretty common um, because uh, not every insect or, or every organism that feeds on the plant is going to get enough of that sort of inocula necessarily. And sometimes they might even be more resistant to it. Um, but like if it were to get sprayed on it, like all the different spores germinating on its body is going to be super effective in a way that um, the feeding sort of maneuver is less effective. And it's also unclear um, how we could even facilitate some of those dynamics. Potentially in the future, we would have some of that information, which I'm excited to hear about as well. Um, 
there are some leafhopper fungi out there for like other leafhoppers, like the rhododendron leafhopper and things like that. But they so mostly what, what's infect the egg cases. And then what, you know, in the nature, what is their predator then? What do they succumb to mostly? I think leafhoppers are a lot of times eaten by birds. Okay. Um, but I think it really, I mean, like that's kind of, uh, that's a really cop-out answer because a lot of it, birds are insectivorous. So <laughs> is uh, <laughs> you know there I mean? any predatory wasp or anything? And but after that, I want to give Kyle a chance because he said he's got to get going at eight or five o'clock West Coast time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to be honest, I don't actually know a whole lot about the the predators for leafhoppers. I think a lot of them tend to be um, either ones that use like traps, like in the case of like a spider for something like that, um, because they're kind of moving very quickly and they're flying in the air. Um, but I don't have a, a, a good, better answer for that, but I'm sure people can look it up. I'll put it in the, a chat, actually. That sounds good. Well, Kyle, uh, any final thoughts and shout outs before you get running? Yeah, sorry. I'm uh, just kind of exhausted over the weekend, you guys. Um, it's like a two and a half hour ride, which I know isn't, it isn't a lot in all reality, but just whatever, just the whole weekend thing. But uh, uh, yeah, if, uh, some really cool stuff coming soon for anyone that cares. Uh, I think in like maybe seven or eight weeks, uh, all my pregnant mothers are uh, should have mature seeds at that point. I have like a lot of pregnant females right now. It's like actually really exciting. Like uh, I got a lot of female pollen, which is very exciting because the last like the last attempt, I got a lot, all reversal, but no pollen. And uh, I guess it was a user error on my part. I should not have relied on one variety to give pollen when you're doing feminizing. You always want to spray a couple to ensure that at least one of them dump if you're using new ones. Um, but uh, yeah, so some seeds coming. And uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions about what's going on or about maybe breeding or maybe how I do things or how my setup is and what's convenient for very heavy set up to the point where it's just really convenient for me, but, uh, reach out pure underscore breeding on Instagram, pure breeding on Facebook, pure breeding, the letter M, the letter a at gmail.com. If you want to email and you're just listening and uh, pure And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll be in touch. Everybody else. See you guys next Sunday. Thanks for joining us, Kyle. Thanks. Peace out, Kyle. Night, Kyle. Later, man. I also want to say cheers to, uh, Brandon Rust, who had to get going earlier, and um, I, I didn't have the time to, before I was going to interject and allow him to give sign outs, he had already left the Zoom. So cheers to Rust at Brandon. You can find him at uh, BokashiEarthworks.com. But I uh, always appreciate his time and knowledge and info that he shares. With that said. I sit there and listen to him talk all the day, man. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And some people love, and they're like, we want more Brandon. We want more Brandon. But at the same time, I don't want to make it like a – Bokashi Earthworks, uh, like NASA Agritech commercial or whatever, because some people aren't going to use those products. It might not relate to them. And uh, I, I just, I get it. It's his company and we want to, I'm, I'm actually genuinely interested in it. I see that Spartan's using it and uh, I'm considering it myself, but it uh, does get to a point where we want to talk about other things as well. So I'm glad we were able to transition and have a lively conversation so far. And uh, I'm trying to think the American one's been fairly quiet over there. Tao, uh, what are you smoking on tonight? And uh, how are things going in your garden? Yeah, I've been smoking on uh, Amy's mom, so I'm pretty high. <laughs> but um, yeah, just the same stuff is in my garden. It had chocolate that I've been running through. Um, I have a couple of AK blueberry by cheesequakes in there, and I'm actually taking out some Agent Orange shortly. But yeah, other than that, nothing too new. It's all uh, it's all what was in there for a while now. Somebody was smoking on that AK blue uh blueberry by uh cheese week, I think you said it was. Yeah, you sent out. I think it was uh maybe Ty in Vegas over there. Uh, he's on somebody on Eagle show. And Eagle's like, is that a blunt or is it just got a really big resin ring? And he's like, No, this is a joint. And he like turned it and like from the front, it looked like a blunt because it was got so much like resin around it, it almost looked like brown. And they turned it to the side and you could see it was like a paper. But uh mm -hmm. yeah, he said it's some really fire shit. So he's I love that. I love that strain actually, because yeah, so I narrowed it down to two, but now I don't think I can narrow it down much further. Those, I want to keep them both, so I don't know what I'm going to do. I yeah, I have a problem with keeping them. Keeping keep them, them both, both, dude. Hey, make label them one and two, and then start describing yeah. the differences. Yeah, but yeah, I uh, I'm pretty stoned right now. So is it leaning know. more blueberry or cheese wake or combo? What's that? Would you say your phenos are leaning more blueberry or cheese quake, or is it a combination? Oh, definitely leaning more towards the blueberry flavoring. 
Yeah, blueberry and pretty much, <clears throat> yeah, pretty much blueberry and structure and everything too. That's kind of like a lot like the mother, but um, I think they're a little more vigorous. They're quicker and root easier. Isn't that, yeah. The cheese I actually was debating on whether I should like continue making them because they're really so similar, at least in flavor to the mother. Like, you know, like everybody says, if it doesn't make it better, why bother? You know, you could just go get the uh, the other well, ones. If, if the progeny are more stable, that would be why. Yeah, they're, they're, they're quicker and I definitely like vigorous in the cloning. Yeah. Well, you uh, might may have just yeah, not so come get, across. The... Yeah. So if you get the same effect and you get the same flavor, but you get you you get like what you just said, you got better plant growth right. in some way, then that's better. You made it better. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about that about um, like breeders finding a male that's kind of like plain that you could use to just maybe improve females that you find that that will let the female keep its flavor and and her profile but we'll make it either uh, more frosty or uh better stronger you know right so, or yeah or something. that would be cool to have like a, a father that that will be a blank page to the mother but just make it stronger yeah. and more frosty you know damn you have a you have to have a really good eye to to catch that you know king you solomon really take your notes rasta There's jeff a couple of breeders that have like the white and a couple other strains that like they have they claim that they have like that's what they have that's what that's what they uh yeah ross the jeff cool. has that king solomon which is a phenotype <laughs> a male of one of his uh famous crosses i can't remember which arise. Cross is. arise and then there's also um i think exotic genetics has one he calls platinum and everything he crosses to the platinum gets frostier and like denser mm -hmm. and high potency I don't know what they're doing at 20, 20 Mendocino, but that's the most fucking vigorous shit I've grown in a long time. They always got these big, fat, vigorous fucking stocks, and you're, like, begging them to slow the fuck down. <laughs> I think that's just the area, dude. Every Like, my buddy, uh, Vegan Doja, he, he was up in, not Mendocino, but, like, that green triangle, like, Southern Oregon, like, Humboldt, Mendocino. Like, I do, maybe I'm over-mystifying it, but I think there is something special out of the seeds that come out of that place because everything I got from Vegan Doja and all the other Humboldt breeders I've gotten stuff from, has been fantastic extremely vigorous really healthy really resistant resilient yeah even Just outdoor like, i mean they're fucking well ba baked right now has a couple of fucking veg plants i was fucking rubbing on today and fuck there's some beautiful glue sniffers he's got going and it's just like dude i hope the weather breaks soon or something because you're gonna have some monsters out there man these things are not fucking slowing down that's where the energy vortex is over cannabis somewhere up there in the humboldt triangle not like the like the human ones in Arizona or whatever. They claim to have like where there's trees grow twisted because the yeah. bullet to seize are so potently powerful. I just conjure them up myself. You know, I'm supposed right? to be in a healing vortex here in, in San Diego. Like there's this place called the Self Realization Fellowship, and they claim that this is one of the healing vortexes where people like live longer or whatever. But the mysticism aside, I think that uh, it's cool to find really vigorous plants, right. regardless whether they're from crystals, indeed. But uh, I was thinking of one because people often, I think it was the last show or maybe the show before people were asking about outdoor strains that are really resistant. And I am kind of taking the breeder at his word, but I respect this breeder a lot. We just mentioned uh, some of his work, AK bean brains, his blueberry. Uh, he also has one called the Friesland, which or it might be Friesland. I don't know how they pronounce it, uh, but I guess it's like a Dutch strain that they kept because although it's like kind of like Larfy and uh, not like the most potent stuff in the whole world, I guess it's extremely resilient, like outdoor. It'll just like never mold, no matter how rainy, cold, and shitty the weather is. So he said for people that are in those really harsh conditions, that's another one that has just been like bulletproof as far as never getting mold, even in the worst, the worst environment. So Do you know if that's a fast finisher or a, or a late finisher? You know, I can't really recall if he said he was just on uh, fucking talking shit with Eagle. And um, so... I'll check it out. Yeah, that's it... Uh, was a, it was a good episode and he is a good dude he's done a lot of great work in fact i, I mentioned on a later episode of the weed nerd world that the only 10 out of 10 review i've ever given like a buddy like a home grower i'll call him reed because every time i say his actual name he changes it so uh shout out to reed but he gave me a gmo cross to mtf from ak bean brains seeds that he grew um, and it, to me, it smelled a lot like MTF or Mantanuska Thunderfuck or Alaskan Thunderfuck, as some people know it as. So I thought it was going to be kind of like more sativa -y based on the smell and my experience with that other, the mother strain. But when I smoked it, it was kind of more like a indica, but it was just definitely some of the best stuff I've ever come across and had all sorts of different crazy effects. And I'm a huge fan. So it uh, showed me that his gear can be very legitimate. 
and he likes the GMO. He said it's like one of the only like more like hype cuts that he's gotten up there in Alaska. That's like more modern. He hasn't gotten to try the cam or a lot of other stuff, but uh, he bred some fire with that. That GMO across to his uh, MTF was definitely, I'm considering looking around for some seeds of it, even though I have enough seeds for the next six years of grows. I did math the other day, unfortunately. So I'm like yeah. seed embargo, but then I see some stuff. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I should get those. Yeah. I mean, if people like that kind of stuff, look at skunk house. We've been, we've done very well popping seeds from them and finding similar things, not only potent, but yeah, like super like funky, like, uh, like the Han Soloberger side is like the gas, gas you know, that's gas with your funk. And then the Donnie Burger is like, remove the gas and it's all funk. At least my opinion. The GMO is like the one that we grow is just like, garlic in your face so much garlic and and uh foul like i don't like the flavor it's so strong and it's oily like it's like it's thick smoke that hangs around and fucking coats your fucking bong it makes everything smell like that but it's fucking the highest one of the best highs if you like the potent remove pain high that's gonna just melt you gmo donnie burger both have kind of that high I shoot for the Donnie Burger just for the flavor profile. <laughs> and for those who don't know, Skunk House is the person who found GMO. GMO doesn't mean garlic, mushroom, onion. I kind of make this little statement after we talk about it because a lot of people think it means garlic, mushroom, onion. He named it after like the Girl Scout cookies. They had thought that the strain initially was called garlic cookies from Mamico Genetics, a Spanish breeder, I believe. And they're feminized or whatever. And he found a pheno in there in that gmo cookies or whatever uh, they called it gmo cookies uh sometimes other places but um it's garlic cookies and it ended up getting named gmo that cuts it's not, it's not its own strain a lot of people think that like gmo is its own thing it's not like people have since bought fem seeds from mamiko you re-released that line but uh skunk house has done a great job as spartan said producing stuff with like they f8 a larry og to get their mail kind of like um the American one was talking about earlier, like if you could find a male that just like only adds a certain thing or like doesn't add much, you could work with it. I think he kept that because it adds like gas and like good structure and good yield and just loves OGs and they tend to be very potent. So whatever they did in the F8 selection process of that Larry OG and then crossing it to the GMO, making the Han Solo, that stuff's fire. And then back crossing that again to GMO, which that makes the uh, Donnie Burger. It's GMO, cross the GMO, cross the Larry OG F8 which uh, I just grew recently. I didn't love my pheno, but my buddy locally has a pheno, like Spartan mentioned, that's just like all funk and just like super potent. Like I'm a all day user every day and use a lot. And uh, that stuff will definitely change, change your head up and uh, make you feel it instantly, even after using a lot of different stuff. So shout out to Skunk House Genetics and they're available. Check out their Instagram. They list where their stuff is posted. There are unfortunately people that sell fake seeds. And so you got to watch out for that stuff. Um, they've listed like 10 different seed banks that they sell their stuff at. So I was able to find their stuff. A lot of people are like, oh, I can never find their stuff. I'm like, just go search on their Instagram page. You'll find it. And there's lots of reputable seed banks that you can get their stuff at. So cheers to them. Again, not sponsored, but I just uh, do like to share one. Everybody asks me like, Jack, what breeders do you think are legit? And they're definitely yeah, they one of them. a lot too. So I think it's good to shout out breeders that you know have good stuff. And I'd so much rather highlight the good ones than like, trash talk the bad ones because you know shit my stuff i've sent out velvet punch has hermied and that's one thing that a lot of people like to shit on breeders for is having hermie genetics it's like i sent out as testers and you know three or four out of the 26 who grew them found hermes but uh that being said a lot of people found stuff they liked and i've learned that it's it's best just to highlight the people that are doing really good work because there's i would say probably less than like 100 in my opinion that are doing like amazing work and there's thousands out there so there's a lot of noise to sort through to try and find those good ones so as much as we can highlight the good and great and like legacy ones like uh, AK Beam Brands is an older guy not to like be grim but a lot of these guys they're only going to be around for so long they're only going to be able to do so much work so uh, like he and Subcool Subcool is no longer with us have said it's like once you get my seeds do whatever you want with them and I love that people are taking that genetics and then like Tao is like what are the chances that AKB Brands would have ever crossed it to Cheesequake you probably never would have so the fact that you made that cross you're doing something and making it available to people that Otherwise, wouldn't have been. So I think it's a beautiful thing for the community. So I just got to commend you for that, Tao. And, well, yeah, and I, that's the thing. Like some, they would never. Uh, like if you're not, if you're a breeder, like you're not going to go take somebody else's stuff unless, like, you know them and you talk with them and you can do a collab. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to cross other people's stuff 
you know, even cross people that hate each other. That's what I always think about there. You know, you know, these breeders are in a war, take, take strains from each of them, cross them together and like give them away and shit. That's what I want to do one day too. That's hilarious, man. That's funny. Cause uh, I've seen like other stuff, like ethos tried to undercut like uh, the guy who made the Bruce Banner dark horse. Cause they had gotten a big falling out and he's like, Oh, you're not a real breeder. I'm going to basically put out Hulk angry IBL, which was supposed to be like his free Bruce Banner. season. he gave them to everybody in the community. If you like emailed him, you could have got some. And so that was like a breeder thing. And as we talked about the slurricane earlier, I think it was uh, maybe it was in-house genetics and somebody else um, archive. I think were the two that both released slurricane and called it the same name uh, with the same cross. It was like Dosido across the purple punch, I think. Yeah. And so that caused a lot of drama. <laughs> so I think somebody bought a pack from both of them and then like F2 would it, <laughs> like took a male from one and like a female from the other. <laughs> I, I, love that kind of think, stuff. I can't, I think we've talked about this before, Jack, cause I think I'm, I'm in my head. I'm hearing you say these, this words, but I really think the best way to just talk about genetics and not have drama is just be like, follow everything by the breeder. Like if you want to call it fucking whatever you want to call it, if you want to call it slurricane in-house genetics slurricane or archive seed banks slurricane. And that's all the bullshit. Yeah. 2020 did a, a write-up post about this. It's like musicians. If you look up like song names like if you th- if you say purple rain most people think prince right but anybody can go out there and make a song called purple rain and there are like i've talked about on if you type in white widow there's like 30 people producing white widow but if you do the research you'll find out the guy who actually like originally made it popular is now calling it black widow because he had a falling out with like his original seed bank that he worked with so shanti baba the original breeder of that strain um and there's some debate about it but if you really look into it he's clearly the person who is responsible for it uh, when he left Greenhouse Seeds, he changed the name. So if you were going to look for like the authentic White Widow, he'd be called Black Widow now. But I, I totally agree with you, Spartan. I think anybody should be able to call it whatever because the problem is there's only so many names. My buddy Vegan Doja, he is not spending as much time on the internet as a lot of these other Instagram breeders. So he named something Velvet Punch. And I think Skunk House has a Velvet Punch. And there's another breeder who has a Velvet Punch. Well, guess what? They're all purple punch crosses. So punch at the end makes sense, right? Because it's a purple punch cross. And like Velvet... It has like a texture, like the fuzzy, like kind of the look to it. And the plants can kind of look like that. So like a lot of people, I guess some people would even argue there's like no original idea. So as long as you put by Doja DNA at the end or by Skunk House at the end, then everybody will know and you don't have to feel deceived. And if you're going to breed with somebody's work, even if you change the name, like let's say I got uh, the American ones, uh, Amy Aces, and I got a really cheesy Fino and uh, it smelled like cheddar or whatever. And I'm just going to call my cut like, the cheddar one because it was my first the number one pheno but i'll say in parentheses amy aces by the american one and yeah, like the, the yeah. golden ticket or a slimer or uh, all that stuff there's yeah. a couple other ones yeah yeah so if you name a pheno it just at least give credit to the genetic lineage because i think especially from like a medical user's perspective that gives the people who are looking for at least similar crosses or even the same genetic lineage the idea it's like dog breeding right if you like golden retrievers you might also like Labrador retrievers. They have some shared genetics, but they're also different, but they have a lot of commonalities and you can start to break down exactly what you like and what's going to work for you. Yeah. And I mean, I, uh, I was recently reminded that, um, you know, speaking of like the names and everything like that, like, I'm sure we're all very aware, <laughs> very well aware of the various names that are kind of just, um, very similar to like actual brand names and some of the litigious nature of the comparing companies that have not liked this. And I was reminded that uh, Toys R Us successfully sued, uh, um, I think it was a dispensary, right? Cause they were called like Herbs R Us or something like that. Wow. That, that one's even uh, <laughs> less of a like obvious, there was like the, uh, well, they even took the exact same logo. I mean, they use it. The yeah. Didn't they use a giraffe they too? Did yeah. They I say a giraffe too, just a stone looking <laughs> crap. They it's like oh, Skittles. Just the name there. There was other so bad. actions. Right? Well, the thing yes. with that one, Toys R Us in particular, if you want to know a little bit about business, Toys R Us does not own their logo. They spend really? like $500,000 a year to license their logo from a separate company. It's a tax shell kind of thing. Is so, that because the, oh, I see. Yeah, it's a, it's literally like they're paying this company, you know, X amount of dollars per year so they can deduct that amount of dollars per year from their cost line. And it is just one of those ways big businesses can work. Um, but yeah, it was exposed to me in some like documentary or something, but it, that is really happening. Like Skittles. I thought Toys R Us went out of business anyway. 
I think they probably have, maybe in the U.S. at least. But um, Skittles, oh, the, okay. the strain, yeah. changed it to a Z, and they thought that would help. But they're using the slogan, Taste the Rainbow, which is a patented trademark or whatever by the Skittles company. And those candy manufacturers in particular, like those are three of the biggest businesses in like the whole entire world. Like you don't want to fuck yeah. with those. <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I don't know. Like I don't want to, I know that like over time, like there's definitely historical examples of, you know, words change, names change, things become not protected or become public, um, you know, publicly accessible, all that sort of stuff. But I, I don't know. I know that a lot of people made those names not thinking that they would have to worry about it. But like, for me, maybe I just have a creative artist problem of like wanting to be unique and maybe even too much so, or like having a particular style. But that's like, not that's not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I feel like that's really um, no. What people don't understand is is the way trademarks and the way patent law is is you are required to defend them, and if yes, you don't, I, you I think you're lose right. them. So it's not yeah. like these they're worthless. Want if you to don't. be dicks and they don't want to be assholes, but they're, they're like required to do that to keep their patent up. It's true. It's uh, why Disney is so litigious, for example, and very protective. And um, you know, this is kind of a little bit of an offshoot, but. Uh, Apparently, Japanese businessmen um, and uh, and copyright and IP is particularly legit. They're very litigious over there as well. Very protective. It's the most expensive uh, law to litigate, too. So if you're going to get into copyright law and patent law, that's the most expensive per hour for any legal costs. Like even above, like if you get in a, in a murder case, that's going to cost you less to litigate than if you have a fucking copyright infringement. Crazy enough. But one that surprised me and... I'm happy for them because I'm a fan of them as a company. Again, shouting out the good breeders out there, Humboldt Seed Company, uh, Nat Pennington. There's two Humboldt breeders out there, and I think they're both actually legit, but Humboldt Seed Company had a strain called Jelly Ranchers, which what does that sound like? Jolly Ranchers. They changed it to Hella Jelly, which to me is way further away from the brand name. Uh, Hella is like a NorCal word. They're a fucking NorCal breeder or whatever, and, and not necessarily just NorCal, but at least that's where I know it from regionally. And then jelly, it's like, that's pretty generic. So, and it, it smells kind of like a jelly, like a cherry or not. Uh, it smells like the cherry Jolly Rancher, I guess, is the, you know, that they're picking out. But at least they were smart enough to change the name before they got sued and got a bunch of exposure for that name that was closer to the actual like copyrighted uh, candy name. And it's a better name. So it's a win-win anyway. I think so. It's uh, funny because when I got them, gifted to me they were labeled under the old name but i'll i'll label them the new name to avoid any drama moving forward but I, we can definitely reflect back on girl scout cookies their dispensaries got in trouble and uh we've also saw the hash brothers um matt rise he was using like the mario brothers kind of logo and wrote like hash bros they they had people come after him and gorilla glue josie wales who came on this show uh, a long time ago i think it was like episode 54 way back and uh, Gorilla Glue sent him a cease and desist and he described how he thought that it was like fake and like bullshit. And then like by the second time he was already basically like being taken to court for real, for real. So they ended up settling. And for anybody who doesn't know, Josie Wales uh, read the GG4 kind of unintentionally with like a Hermione's room, but it ended up being fire and kept it and spread it around the whole world and had to change the name from Gorilla Glue Floor to Original Glue. And it, you could write like formerly known as uh, GG4 for like a year or something was the settlement but after that it had to be called original glue and then they had like gg5 and things like that but they wouldn't put the actual gorilla glue they could just shorten it or whatever but yeah interesting if you're thinking about breeding consider these name uh quandaries before you maybe stick your foot in your mouth because a lot of people i think are like hey we're small enough these big yeah. brands are never going to hear about us but guess what they google shit they google their own names and when they start seeing cannabis stuff pop up and they're associated with like selling candy to children Trust yeah. me, they, they don't like that stuff like i saw a rapper who once used to like google the tags for youtube that would get the most views right and then sometimes it would be like disney channel or whatever so he was like rapping like profanity and things like that he's like tagging like disney channel like kids youtube whatever and then like he got his shit banned for a while because uh yeah they don't like that and uh so it's good just to be honest and label your things appropriately i guess don't get into legal troubles. Nobody really wants that shit. Trust me. It's uh, if you can avoid it, try your best. I'm reminded that uh, there's this um, there's this uh, anime, and like 
all the antagonist characters have like a name that's like related to like a a rock band usually or some sort of music band so like beach boys uh king crimson um uh you know all these various other names and it's just so funny hiroki haraki is his name the author it's called jojo's bizarre adventure and the funny thing is that like when you see the adaptations they've changed the names like the japanese people are saying the english name but the subtitles will be like instead of like killer queen it's like lethal queen or something like that and um they did the series developed in like the 80s so like they were able to get away with some things um over others and uh, i don't know i always whenever we talk about this i'm always reminded of that because it's just so i don't know just funny how like especially international copyright works right like if you're not even in the same country you know that's just a whole other ball game totally agree i also thinking about like names just looking at our panel of people that it's actually throwing stuff out there like brandon's got like lime orilla like nobody else has anything named like that uh brandon or amy aces from tau i guess godiva you could get in trouble with that one Tao. but uh amy aces i think you're pretty square on that we got bliss bud from uh spartan so i mean velvet punch i think is safe or even velvet bastard whenever that comes about and uh I like that. I love that. It's going to be Velvet Punch, the zigzag pheno across to the uh, Australian bastard and nice. try and make the funkiest looking uh, Jack Greenstock freak show cannabis that I can just for fun. But that's going to be a side project. Uh, those lady could dive a Jack. They can't like hold that against me. I don't think. Mm, maybe. Unless I was selling chocolate, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, lady I think they have, I think Lady could dive, but that's a good one to hold on to, man. Because that's, yeah. that's well past any copyrights, I think. Yeah, is lady it. godiva a person and i'm just real ignorant because i only think godiva chocolate when i hear Godiva. godiva you don't know the story lady godiva dude let's hear it tao can that. you give me the well, elevator pitch of lady godiva. either but it's a naked lady on a horse right or is that some other lady perhaps i like the sound of it i mean i'm in you you know, just know from the lyrics of that uh, queen song where he brings up lady godiva but uh somebody else must know who lady you i always on hear panel. well we can google it i'm sure it'll pop it up all right well yeah i'm sorry I yeah it's it's yeah no it's um yeah so I, just I, I, looked, it I looked it up it was from god I, God. <laughs> I wanted to be sure that i, and I right. actually what i was reminding what i was remembering was not totally correct here so i'm glad i looked it up um so right so the wikipedia you can just look this up lady godiva or an old english uh gold gifu perhaps uh late Anglo-Saxon noblewoman who is relatively well documented as the wife of Leofric, Earl of Mercia or Mercia, and a patron of various churches and monasteries. That is a naked woman on a horse. That is correct. That is the depiction that I'm bringing up here. So yeah, of course, a chocolate company is going to want to use this imagery, right? Like, come on. Well, coffee companies like naked women. I mean, look at Starbucks. If you go to the original store, they got a naked woman on their logo. The original logo is a woman with her breast out. Naked then, mermaid or a woman? It's a woman. It's a. Oh, yeah. If you go to Starbucks, if you see the regular logo, the woman's head is just like in a circle. But if you go to the actual first Starbucks store, I think it's in Seattle. Um, Pike's also, Market in Seattle. I've been there yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's like right by that fish market. I think Pike Place Market where they throw the fish. Yeah, Pike Places. That's a cool place, That's man. Crazy totems, yeah. But yeah, they. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Lady Godiva, and, and you've got another one. Uh, Tao, it's it's Amy Ace's Lady Godiva, and then. Uh, yeah. Ophelia. Ophelia was the original three. Lady uh, was the original three. Godiva, Ophelia, Amy Aces. And then I'm going to, uh, yeah, because I named, I'm going to name, if the Bruce Banner crosses come out right, they're going to be Lori Walters and I think Jennifer Walters. But maybe I might, shouldn't not do that because they're the, uh, quote, female hunk, hulks from the uh, co comics. You know what I'm saying? What's the, uh, I just got to hear the reasoning behind wanting to name it after them. Well, I, you know what? I want to name them all girls because, you know, most of the time that's what you want girls in your garden. So say that's why I reach out it. to them, reach out to them and see what they say. Say, hey, I'd like to do this. Are you okay with it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cause, and then, like, yeah, just because of the association with Bruce Banner, they're actually, I think, his second cousin or his cousin. And somehow they accidentally got, you know, hit with the uh, gamma radiation too. And, turned into she hulks there's two of them throughout like the uh the history and i got bruce banner by cheesequake and i got the bruce banner by blueberry 
of which I didn't even grow any of them out yet. So, but other people have, it and it was good. And um, actually, one did get a male flower on one of them, but uh, that was just one out of like you know not a stupid amount that are out there. But I I won't I won't name anything until I grow it out and feel it's worthy of a name because like why waste a name if, we, if it's never going to be like real. So here's my thought. You, some people believe in manifesting. I don't know. There's like a whole secret crew out there. Uh, people that believe in like putting things out there and manifesting them into reality. So if you name something, uh, like I have a few names that I've written down in hopes that I can find certain turkey right. profiles or certain effects. And like one of them, for example, is because it, I don't think anybody's going to steal it personally. And even if they do, I don't care. It won't be by Jack Greenstock. So um, there you go. I'm calling it like riding pine. Because I'm looking for something with pinene, pine flavor, but I'm also looking for kind of like a uh, stimulated effect in the mind, but like more of like a hybrid. Because a lot of the pine stuff I find tends to be either full sativa or like full indica. So what I'm looking for is more of a hybrid effect. And the term riding pine in basketball would be like when you're sitting on the bench, you're riding pine. And the reason for that for me is when you're riding, you're sitting on the bench, like you got to be like relaxed or whatever, but like mentally stimulated. You're like watching the game or whatever and be ready to like get up and do some shit. So if you have to get up and do some shit, you can, but like, you don't necessarily like, it's not like the, I'm going to go clean my house type stuff. So that's just an example of like a name with like a desired smell and effect that I'm shooting for. But, and I have an idea of a few strains that I might work with to make that happen, but it's a long ways from being an actual reality. It's like a basketball version of a couch lock, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but like not fully couch lock where you're gonna like do nothing like that. The important thing is because yeah, pining, it's not called benched. <laughs> right, exactly, example. exactly. Riding the bench, but yeah, riding pine te- technically, I guess, in the traditional sports term is more when you're not getting much, much playing time. But uh, I like the idea of pining keeping you alert and stimulated. And for most people, I think they do get that uh, effect if they've been able to come across those strains. They're not as popular nowadays, unfortunately. You can find it more in concentrate, I find, than uh, an actual flower. In some my area. Northern lights, northern lights look, look through that. That has pine in it a lot. Yeah, I've got some Kineos lights, which is a northern lights back cross, uh, F2, I should say. And um, when I popped them, I got all males and I grew berry lights alongside it, which was like a nice berry pine, which I really did enjoy. Berry pine and gas. It was a mother of berries crossed to their Kineos lights, which is the uh, F2 oh, northern that sounds, lights. That sounds interesting. The berry pine. It was so dank, man. I saw, shout out to Father Mike, I, rest in peace, we chatted him out a few weeks ago. He was the one who inspired me to grow it because I saw his grow and he had some big old chunks. They were nice and uh, they weren't super purple, but they had like little kind of touches of purple. And like mine actually had like a blue almost after it cured, like the purple kind of like faded into like a silvery, like blue leaf and a uh, beautiful smoke too. One that I still have seeds of. So I'm a big fan of Kineos Genetics out there in Maine. Good people. They have a garden center. They actually carry uh, 50 strands of green in person. You can go and buy the book, hard copy. Yes. That's awesome, Jack. That's got to make you proud to be able to walk into a fucking physical retail location and see your fucking book somewhere. That's fucking cool. Not only that, they're like great people, man. I saw them on fucking Talking Shit with Eagle and I like, fell in love with their story. They kind of, uh, when they got married, they did like a tour around the US and hit up all the weed nerds and like met up with people all over. And they just had such a good vibe. And they worked with a lot of genetics that I was interested in. So I, you know, gave a chance and supported them and bought direct from them and they hooked it up and uh, can't speak highly enough of uh, the great people in the community. I'm a fan of their genetics. It's definitely not your like modern stuff, I would say. It's more, they really have their own kind of tastes over there. And uh, I, I appreciate that. It's cool to see people working with not just ice cream cake cookies and OGs and stuff, you know, it's uh, great to have diversity, but there's tons of people out there like there's stuff that I don't tap into personally, like the land race stuff. Those people that are doing preservation projects, like growing the crazy acetivas and yeah. hazes and all that. Like I'm not, I'll grow the hybrids, like the nine to 10, maybe 11 weekers, but I'm not growing 14 weekers right now or something that's going to be a 20 foot tall plant. I might fuck with something like that one of these days. It'd be fun if you have the uh, space or like uh, I heard somebody, I think, um, he was calling himself like Haze Hound on F- FCPO2. I can't think of their actual uh, name. Elka, I think, on Instagram. Elka something. But they were saying that they met somebody who was growing haze, and they had a plant that was growing like along the side of the grow room that they literally stapled uh, to the wall like a, a vine. 
and they just like left it there for <laughs> as many runs uh, as it needed to, to finish. Crazy. They're like, it was airy enough that it didn't get any mold at all. <laughs> like the buds would be far enough off the wall and like, it would just be literally like kind of like Christmas lights, how they're strung on a house. Just like staple, 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 like between the nodes. I would just yeah. literally have fucking yo-yos hanging from the ceiling, just fucking, fucking hanging this fucking vine, just doing a circle around the room <laughs> under the lights. With something like that, I like to use like a tomato cage and just kind of like wrap it around the outside and just like keep weaving it in and out or like have a, a scrog or trellis and just kind of weave it in and out as much as you can. Eventually it stops stretching and then you just kind of let it sit there until it looks nearly smokable because <laughs> sometimes it seems like bullets never finish. Like some people talk about these go like 22, 24 weeks. I'm like, I can't so maybe, even imagine. Oh, it's kind of late for to get into this discussion, but maybe you or Dr. Coco can help me understand this. I'm running uh, one of GML's lights, the, uh, it's the long legs, but anyhow, it has added, it's like 730 nanometer. It's like a red light. And um, I waited till after the stretch because I just, I'm just afraid of red light causing more, more stretch. But after the stretch, so after week four, I threw, I got Donnie Burger under there and I got New York Sour Diesel under there. And, uh, or oh, I had Banana Daddy underneath there too. And they didn't fucking stretch hardly at all. So there's something to do with like an, well, I mean, I wasn't using the red at all. I was just using the regular whites for the first four weeks. And then that, I didn't get hardly any stretch at all, but it's like now I'm running the lights. And I think it's supposed to be only the first like hour of the cycle. And then like the last couple hours of the cycle or some shit, but I'm just running the whole time. Cause I'm waiting for a controller first to be able to do that. And, uh, these fucking plants look great. So I'm going to just keep running fucking full time. I don't see how much power are you putting into the 730s? Do you know? It's only 700 or it's only 97. It's 73 watts or something like that or 70 watts or something like that. And how much power do you have going to par light? I think the whole light is a 700 watt light. Okay. So how much is going to? So less than 10%. 10%. It's like 5% ish like yeah, between yeah, 5 and 10. Fine. The time that I, it's not really going to make the plants bolt more. The flowering stretch after you flip to 12, oh, 12. So I could actually put it for the first four weeks and be fine. Yeah, it will make the plants stretch a little bit more as seedlings. It does, it, you know, right. far red light promotes stem elongation at that I got like, a blue throughout, spot. but it's not really good. You're not going to notice it much during the, the stretch itself. Sweet. Um, okay. And yeah, I would, I would run it the whole time because those photons are also powering photosynthesis, the seven thirties. Yeah. That's the whole Emerson weirder is like, it doesn't, I don't know how else to explain it, but fatter um, buds, like not elongated, not, not, I don't know if it's more weight, but it just looks like they're stouter. Like, like you took a bud and you just like that and it went like this. <laughs> yeah. Plumper. Plumper. Yeah, yeah the 730 Dense. is definitely the sort of outside of traditional par light that has the best evidence of being really helpful for us, both in flower development and stem elongation. Um, well, and it, so using it early in the grow to help seedlings and using it uh, during the flowering period to help flower develop. Okay, well, you just fucking gave me a lot less anxiety now. Thank you. Uh, Spartan, I've been using it for two years now with my little handmade DIY light. I have the 730 kind of strapped in there with 660, 440, and 3500K. So it's kind of a mix, but I was worried a little bit because I had been told about how far red can make it stretch more, but it's about the ratio. And if it's like under 10%, like mine's like 3% or something, um, but I think yours is like 7 or something. And that percentage, we're talking like 90 plus is in the red that are not known for elongating as much. And they just make those other reds work even better. So like when 660 works alone, we'll call it like an 8 out of 10. But when it's there with the 730, it gets like 10 out of 10 efficiency. Okay. Plus the 730, which would on its own get like a 1 out of 10, is now working at like a 3 out of 10 when it's paired with the 660. So the Emerson effect just makes both of those reds more efficient for um, photosynthesizing, which ultimately that's what you're trying to get your plant to do, to grow and produce right. buds exactly. and secondary cannabinoids and everything. I think that you'll notice probably uh, richer terpenes. Everybody was telling me, oh, you're going to get faster flowering times, maybe a day or two, but like I run from seed each time. And um, unless you're running clones and like, you know, the exact harvest date with like the far red, I, I also tried like the uh, 15 minutes after the lights go out, my main white 3,500K. 
I just have 730, 660, and 440 as my like sunset and sunrise for 15 minutes on uh, after and 15 minutes on before the lights go on. And so just for sunrise and sunset, or are you trying to reduce the dark period? I'm not actually reducing the dark period, although I know that you can run up to like 13 hours on and like 11 off. Uh, mainly More it's, yeah. I've that, seen that's go. the other thing you can do with a standalone, but that would just be the 730 light. So if you have a standalone 730 fixture or you can turn on the 730 diodes without turning on the rest of the light, I will um, it. running it for 15 minutes after the, the light goes out, you can shorten the, the dark cycle, shorten the dark period by a couple of hours. Does it work on the opposite end of the beginning of the light cycle or no? It supposedly um, helps them wake up is what I've been kind of told but i also have been told that they can take almost peak photosynthesis right as the light turns on so yeah uh, so it'd be only worthwhile to set it up for i've only minutes, yeah I, I don't know about doing it before or if it would have a similar effect or sort of shorten it by the same amount but we talked about it in the past and mainly it's for humidity regulation i think like going from the dark to the light it also helps just by not having your full wattage on it kind of gradually tapers from like fully uh lights to like complete blackness it goes like fully lighted to like your sunset effect to then it's dark oh. and then in the wake up cycle it's kind of the same thing so you're gradually rising up the light. And I don't know, I think uh, something about that effect may be a little bit easier on the plants, but I could be totally wrong. No, I, I actually agree with that. Mainly though, it's not because the plants, the light, when the LED first turns on, it's at its most powerful. Um, I have to wait usually half, at least half an hour, sometimes like 45 minutes before the lights settle down into sort of where it's going to be running. Um, and it can be 10% higher than that for when you first turn it on. So if you're pushing the limits and you're trying to yeah. be sort of right up against the edge of it, um, when your lights first come on, it's not, it's not just that they're at hundred percent, they're like at 110% for that first half an hour. And that, that can be sorry, too much. So if you're trying to really push up against the limits, I like the sunrise just for, for that reason that you don't hit them with sort of more light than they ever want right in the first hours of the morning. The trick that I've done uh, for now, so like, like I said, it's like get a light timer to be able to do things like a sunrise. I, uh, I just have, I have two lights in my flower room. So I just have one, the one that's less power. Anyway, I have that one turn on normal 12, 12 cycle. And then that part, that GML light, the one that's like 700 Watts. I have that one just running 11 hours on to compensate for that because it's fucking smashing at a thousand when i used my pulse meter to take a par reading i believe it's a par reading no ppf reading it was a thousand it gave me like a thousand yeah. or something and i was like a thousand that's fucking a lot so yeah a thousand. I, cranked it, I cranked it down to just 11 hours of that <laughs> instead of 12. So this is a five by five space Spartan? what's yeah this? yeah it's probably yeah it's probably like five by five space and you know, I would say more by four by five space that to be fair, because it's two, two, four by fours and, it, and it's covering uh, this spills over on the sides. So I'd say four by five. OK. OK, what's your initial thoughts on the uh, like build quality, like the feel of the light, the construction of it and um, all I like that it at first um, it's it came and it's folded. And I can see that that's obviously important for shipping, makes shipping easier. Though I, I mean, there was a big ass box to begin with because it was an eight bar light. But, uh, and I can see where you could pinch yourself in that fucking fold. So that's a little, I wasn't too thrilled on that until I had to take it downstairs and was able to fold it. I was like, well, that's fucking convenient. But other than that, I don't see how that's going to be like applicable past the first time getting it down the stairs, you know? So it's a feature, but is it some, you know? But what I do like about the other things is like, like you said, you know, how is it like durability? I fucking threw it up there. No problem. All by myself. And uh, seems fucking fine. It's big ass light, though. So, I mean, it's like it's spread out, I guess I should say. It's pretty close to, I would imagine, the size of a four by four, like the actual physical footprint of this fucking light. It's fucking big. Yeah. That's pretty common. You know, 120 centimeters. Uh, well, there's a shipping restriction at 118 centimeters. Okay, so that makes sense. Most of the largest lights on the market are almost exactly 118 centimeters in the longest dimension, which is just under four feet. Um, 
when basically would be wall to wall, like all the five by five fixtures that I test are wall to wall in a four by four space. And that's just a shipping restriction. And you're right. The foldability, I think, is only for shipping and storage. There's no sort of during the grow application of folding your light. I mean, I like the I mean, this is not these aren't like features that aren't found anywhere else. But the features I like that are on it are I like for one is waterproof. You know, if you're spraying and you get some overspray, not a big deal. You can wipe it clean. Um, I like that on the fuck. This is the thing. I, this is the little things that impressed me. Before you go on waterproof, does it have a rating like IP65 or? Yes, IP65, I believe, is the rating. Uh, it's on his webpage. Uh, he's got one for Canada, one for the for United States. I just think it's gmlleds.com. I just right asked because I do know there's different levels. Like waterproof is kind of like saying like bulletproof, like a technical. Yeah, I mean, he's got a video on his website of him spraying the fucking thing with a hose when it's on. So Nice. But yeah, no, IP65 uh, is pretty legit. But with the thing that impressed me, and it's little, like I said, but it's got a dimmer on it. So um, when you turn the dimmer, it goes by 1%, and it has a display, and it shows you where you're fucking got it at. Like, I've got it at 50%. I got it at 49%, whatever. And then you click on it, and it goes to the other, the other driver for the reds, and you can change that one, same thing, by 1%. So I could, I could independently dim like whichever one I could dim the whites down to whatever percent or the reds I could turn completely off. That's what I did for the first four weeks. I just turned the fucking, or after actually his first probably three weeks, 21 days, I turned the reds completely off, not the reds, but the far reds. And then yeah, there's probably six, 60 nanometer reds that run on the same circuit that the full spectrum diodes run, right? You're right. Yes. Yeah. And then the seven thirties uh, are on their own circuit. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. yep. And that's exact. So I just, I thought that was cool that even though I don't have the, the light time, the light, uh, what do you call it? Controller to be able to do that. I can do it manually and I can see it with a fucking display. I'm not all the other lights I've had before, like the, well, I don't want to call it other light companies, but other lights that I've had before, there might be like little stops when you turn it and you're just kind of guessing, okay, that might be 50%, but you don't know. Click. Yeah. I can just, mine has nothing. It's, it, it's 10 to a hundred, but it's just a smooth dial. So like you were, kind of just guessing like i took out my little phone meter i put it down there i figure out what the, the canopy level is and i kind of wave my phone around to get an idea of like okay this is between 700 and a thousand like that's pretty ideal or whatever um but it'd be nice if i had the digital readout but um is it absolutely necessary probably not is it cool definitely yeah, <laughs> like i said cool. a little thing that's like probably it. the coolest feature i think i i'm testing a light right now that has a, a digital readout based on the power draw that's giving you that that same granularity and precision so you can set that's it so at cool. like 87 or something um yeah. you, you know i test a lot of lights that only have either 25 percent increments or 20 percent increments so you got to like click it in if you're not 100 percent, you click down to 75 or down to 50 and a lot of growers now, especially with larger lights like this, if you wanted to run it in a four by four, you might want to hit like 82% or 84% or something like that um, and know where you are and be able to match that up to your power draw and stuff. So I actually think that that is a feature that that is helpful for growers, both the granularity of the dimmer and the precision of the dimmer. Super important, I think, uh, to have control and knowledge of where you're at. And, um, and one something... other thing that's on that light that's on a lot of lights, but there's missing on some of the other higher end lights that blows my goddamn mind is it's just got like a, a connection, a network, like a way to piggyback multiple lights. If you have more than one, it's just a network connection, you know, RJ45 port where you can hook it from one light to the next light and then hook that to your uh, light timer or your light controller. Like Daisy I, can't, I don't understand paying, you know, hundreds and hundred dollars for light and, and then having a manufacturer tell you, well, you can wire it in. Like, no, I don't, well, I'm trying to buy a finished light here. Or they make you buy an expensive controller to make them be able yeah, to- Yeah, or you have their special controller. That pisses me off too. It's like, no, make it That's useful racket. with the controllers that work out already that we have on now. Make it useful, you know. Something funny, Spartan, about you saying you turned the seven, we call it 730, anything above 700, we'll call it far red, yeah. is um, even if you turn that down to zero, Knowing that there's 660 diodes and even 3500K diodes, if you if Doc flew out to you with his little uh, beyond 700 par sensor, I bet you even with the zero percent, you'd be getting 700 plus readings just from some of those reds because oh, they yeah. they fall into that uh, spectrum. So you're getting a little bit of it. 
uh, even with them turned all the way down to zero and maybe dunk yeah. it. The, are you talking about getting some far red light? Yeah. yeah. You get far red light from the full spectrum diodes. You get about right, 3%. At least about three percent from the full spectrum diodes of that energy is actually in the far red wavelengths, um, and unless you have a fixture like you do that, that's actually devoting quite a bit of energy, the seven thirty nanometer diodes are not as efficient as the other diodes. They're not nearly as efficient as the six sixty nanometer diodes, for example. Um, so you really have to drive a lot of power to the seven thirty nanometer diodes to generate a good amount of flux. So when you're saying you're getting about 10% of the power to those diodes, you're probably only going to get about 5% of the flux in that range, plus about 3% far red from the full spectrum diodes. So you're riding probably between 8 and 10% of your light is in the far red That's spectrum. That's about as much as I want, though. You don't want much more than that. Uh, anyway. I agree, but you're, you're yeah. actually devoting quite a bit. A lot of lights devote practically no energy to far red diodes. They'll put a few far red diodes in their fixture, but they'll send like 1% of the fixture's power to them. And they don't have measurably more far red light than any other fixture because, I mean, that amount of, of far red light that's coming from those few far red diodes is just dwarfed by the amount of far red light that's coming from the full spectrum diodes already. Um, so I didn't even consider that. On the, so that's a good point, guys. I didn't even consider that. So I still, I think I'm still going to knock those down 50% though, the next grow, just because I'm still a little bit scared on, on, on from from day one to 21 in flower i didn't run any at last this grow so the next round i'm going to bump it up to 50 percent because i know there's three percent already coming during the daytime i mean during the the white light already what do you want to call it full spectrum diodes anyway i'm just afraid to get that up really high early on like that or do you think that's not an issue at all I really, I, I really don't think it's a huge issue during the stretch. Um, the far red light. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at Bugby's. Re, or yeah, trying to find Bugby's research, it. and it has to be so skewed to like. I think until you get to like 50, 50 percent, where it'd be like 50 percent far red and 50 percent like deep red, uh, or more. Like until you get more dominant in the 700 plus, like 730, than you have in the actual like 660s and other reds, right. then you're not going to start seeing like super stretchy stuff. If you were just running like. 100 watts of 730 by itself for like two hours for like the first part of your grow and then like the last 10 hours then you might see like a big stretch or something effect but um as far as that ratios yeah yeah they, they won't <laughs> the 730 light isn't photosynthesized it doesn't power photosynthesis on its own um it, it does in combination with shorter wavelength light um, but you're right, Jack, about the ratios. Um, it needs a pretty good dose before it really starts to affect things um, in terms of those secondary plant biological reactions, like becoming more, having more stem elongation. Um, I, I generally think that it's, it's pretty useful, certainly up to about 10% of the total flux. Um, I'd be willing to go higher than that with far red light. I'd be I'd start to get concerned about overall EPPFD, so the the density of light between 400 and 750 nanometers, if you were supplementing it like a lot. But um, yeah, I, I'd probably run the 730s through most of the grow. Certainly at the very beginning, um, during the the early germination, if you're growing from seeds, especially. But during the cloning stage, it helps with the root development as well. Um, nice. And then during the the flower growth depend, which is really after the stretch, you're right. The rest of the grow, that far red light is just going to be sort of contributing to photosynthesis, contributing to the overall energy that the plant's able to harvest. Spartan, with that said, it's 5:53. We kept you much oh. longer than we typically do, so I'll let you uh, get your final thought and shout out. Yeah, my bladder's been telling me that, so that's sweet. All right, guys. <laughs> well, thank you guys for letting me pick your brain because that's very helpful. I'm just going to run it then. That makes me feel better. I don't. That's I love it when it makes it easier for me. So that's sweet. I don't need to change anything. Nothing to be scared of. Definitely. Yeah. Shout out to chat, man. It's been awesome to see. I saw a lot of uh, new faces in chat today. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I saw a lot of new faces. So that just makes me happy. So uh, as always, everybody just keep on growing. And I'm going to be positive and not say fuck anybody. And <laughs> and uh, thanks for that. Just thanks for having me, guys. Uh, this is a, a bright spot in my week. So it's good to, to share it with y'all. And uh, grow love. Good to see you, Spartan. Peace out. Girls Later, love you, Spartan. Man. Always a bright spot having you on the show. So, yep. Girl love Spartan.
Peace out, Spartan. And uh, we've got about five minutes left. So if anybody has any final thoughts before we get into our final thoughts and shout outs, uh, maybe you could throw them out there before we have to run. I got a couple of things I, I can let people know about. Sure. I got some giveaways. We just announced a new giveaway for the SFAC. We're doing a seed giveaway next week. So everybody that's registered for the spring autoflower challenge is going to be entered into a drawing. We're going to have 10 winners um, uh, from, oh gosh, now I'm, now I'm spacing on my sponsor. I'll circle back around to that. I can't have a seed cow. Um, and we're giving away the Photon Tech light, everybody. We're giving away the Photon Tech XT 1000 watt CO2 Pro. This is a $1,600 1000 watt, uh, 10 bar, um, blows up a five by five space with up to 1500 micromoles of density. Um, Behemoth uh, of a light. Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing light. We're giving it away on 420, but you register now. Um, this week, actually, you, Jack Greenstock, are one of our bonus actions. So if you follow Jack Greenstock's Instagram account, then you get extra entries this week. Um, but check that out on the deals and discounts page on Cocoa for Cannabis. And sign up for the SFAC before the seed giveaway next week, and uh, you'll be entered to win those seeds. So that's Exciting what I stuff. I love that we are able to give away seeds. That makes the community so much of a better place. Like that's my favorite thing to see in the community. One, one of them, at least other than like people harvesting and having plenty of clean medicine for themselves and family. But uh, yeah, that, the seed sponsor is homegrown cannabis cow. So they're giving us away 10 uh, winners. We get two, four packs of autoflower seeds. That's plenty to get them started. Are they uh, feminized? Yeah, and the winners will get to choose between four different strains. Um, dear Lord, now I'm not going to remember all of them. Don't even worry about it, but just know <laughs> that there's going to be a variety. And if you do win, it's incentive to go sign up for the Spring Autoflower Challenge. If you're not already growing autos, check out CocoaForCannabis.com. Be part of a community. It's uh, not a, the grow challenge is more of a grow along. Everybody's growing together and, and learning together. And uh, it's a beautiful thing and lots of things that you can gain from it not only knowledge but you can also get free seeds just for signing up so just for signing up yeah this is the first time we're giving away seeds and the, the only deal is if you win the seeds we want you to grow the seeds in the sfac so um but yeah hey that's that's a pretty low-hanging uh commitment to have to agree to it, it might even give you uh, some people that don't have the option to grow on the auto flower challenge maybe you'll uh, get something you know absolutely so grow our love everybody thanks for letting me share that news all right. Well, next up, we've got Matthew Gates. Yeah, I really enjoyed the chat. We talked about some cool things and even got to nerd out a little bit with some anime. <laughs> I actually expected more people in the chat to respond, but that's OK. Nope. I think that's probably better for everyone. Anyways, if you want to look up some information about education with regards to plant health and pests and integrated pest management, again, you can find me in a few different places, one of which being the spring 2022 issue of Skunk Magazine, where I talk about the pests that you should know for springtime and also uh, moving forward. You can also find me on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol. You can find me for professional inquiries at zenthanol.com. And Instagram and Twitter is at SyncAngel, S-Y-N-C-H-A-N-G-E-L. And um, I'll probably be doing some more live streams about um, how plants detect problems in pests and how they deal with them and how the immune system functions in plants. I find that very interesting. I know a lot of people did too last time I talked about it. So check me out there. Well, great content. And uh, if the people are interested, I'm glad that you're continuing to put it out there. It is uh, important stuff for sure. And I'm glad that we're learning more and uh, becoming more prepared for those problems and uh, learning how to manage them. So thank you as always. And looking forward to checking out the 2022 uh, spring edition of Skunk Magazine myself. With that said, Noah, the grower is next. Yep. Uh, I had a good time today. Um, I'm uh, Noah, the grower with two E's on Instagram. Um, I was just looking, taking a look at my uh, vegetable starts. I'm going to be hitting them with some loss close, maybe do 50% diluted and just a little preventive maintenance. And uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram, my handle there. And uh, I'm Cowboy Blazer fan on Twitter. And I'll, I'm here most weeks and I'll see everybody next week. Great having you, Noah. And I uh, appreciate you inspiring the people out there to grow their own food and also growing their own cannabis. Always an inspiration with your Instagram showing off some dank photos and uh always appreciate you on this panel every week that you're able to make it and last and certainly not least the american one jack as always thanks for hosting and uh thanks everyone on the panel for being here tonight and shout out to aaron and 
Brandon Rust, and whoever else isn't here yeah. right now uh, that I might be forgetting. And shout out to everyone in chat. It's always good uh, hanging out, talking cannabis, or listening to other people talk about it. Um, yeah, I'm the American one. Most of you know where to find me. So I'll, uh, I'll cut it short today. And uh, yeah, have a great one, everyone. All righty. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Tao. And you can find me at Jack Greenstock on Instagram, just like the logo right there. You can also find me, Jack underscore Greenstock on Twitter or email me, JackGreenstock47 at gmail.com if you're trying to get a hold of me. Uh, I would love it if people sent me photos for 50 strains of purple. I'm still working on writing that. Uh, that's why I'm limiting my live streams to try and use some of my free time to finish that up and uh, collect all the photos for that. But uh, if you'd like a copy of 50 strains of green, which is already completed and out there, you can go to 50 strains.com to pick up a copy of that. Thank you all so much for listening and showing up for another week to chat. You guys are always awesome. Great questions this week and uh, appreciate all the regular faces. And like somebody else mentioned, um, we actually do have a lot of new faces. In fact, uh, over just like a month, we gained, I think, five or 600 new listeners. So we went from like 2,500 per show to 3,100 per show. So cheers to everybody out there who listens to this every week. Uh, we love and appreciate you all and everybody on the panel who dedicates your time to showing up and sharing the knowledge. I uh, appreciate that as well. Jack Greenstock signing out. Peace and love, y'all. Have a great week. Grow love, everyone. Happy growing.